Uh, welcome, folks. We uh, have a couple things we want to touch on this morning, and then we're going to open it up for questions. Um, you've asked about cuts in the last couple weeks. Um, we know we had a number last year. Right now, we, we, just, we just don't have a target. We, we have a different group. Um, what I can say is that we're going to continue downward pressure on the size of this government. We, we will identify potential reductions. You've heard some of the discussions about uh, Medicaid and some of the other issues we're working on where we think there's substantial room for um, a better job on managing those costs. Um, so you'll be hearing more from us. You know, we have a house and, and uh, of course, the administration that seem resistant on those cuts, and we'll be reaching out to work together with them for a better result. On taxes, um, mathematically, we just don't believe they're necessary. It's not a rhetorical opposition. It's the fact that we believe that um, gap is closing and will close um, within the next few years if things remain consistent. On the POMV, we insist on a structured draw, and uh, we, we strongly will resist using the earnings reserve without a structured draw. So you're going to see, um, as we discuss with the House and the administration, that uh, before we get to that point of funding this bu budget, and of course our schedule is under 90 days um, for having our work done with the House and the administration, that a structured draw through a POMV is an absolute requirement. We are not going to jeopardize the corpus or the ability to pay dividends out of the uh, permanent fund. So with that, and I don't know what kinds of questions you're going to have, but uh, let's, let's see what comes forward. Questions? Mr. Maurer. Okay. Thank you, uh, Rich. I, I appreciate the question. As you know, I, I have actually introduced a bill on behalf of my constituents, and I'm working with the sponsor, I mean, excuse me, with the chair of the Judiciary Committee in discussions to uh, see if uh, it's going to be uh, scheduled in that committee. So, so not, there's no hearings yet? At this point, no, there's no, nothing scheduled. Well, there's a lot of bills in the process, a lot of bills that do a lot of good, and um, many of those aren't scheduled yet, so I think it's perhaps a little early to see, but I remain uh, optimistic. Rich, the, the Senate majority, uh, in support of every member's right to drop legislation, is going to do what's best for victims, and we're going to make sure that our laws, you know, Senate Bill 91, Senate Bill 54 is not the end all of the results of what we do, need to do in this building. With the opioid crisis and the other problems that are hitting our state, we're going to support members in their efforts to do the best we can in delivering the, uh, the best criminal code that we possibly can, and that's going to be an ongoing effort. So, other questions? Yes, yeah, Steve. I'm going to hand that off to Senator Giesel, and I may touch on it afterward. Well, Steve, you're right. The price of oil has been up. Uh, the upper 60s, uh, actually, last week. Uh, but, you know, the experts are advising not to become overly optimistic. In fact, the companies in this state are advising don't get overly optimistic. As the price comes up, more investments are made, more production is brought online, and then, of course, that supply-demand balance will change so that supply becomes uh, more available, and that, that will drop prices. We don't know what OPEC and Russia will be doing as the price goes up. They may lift their constraints on production. So one thing we do know about the oil industry and the oil supply, it is always changing. 
So just to, to touch on that a little bit from the finance side, is that we, we, uh, we understand those dynamics, right? Anyone that tells you they're going to predict the price of oil has a crystal ball that's not available to me. Wish I had one, but I don't. So we're evaluating in a range, a likely range, and that includes um, a downturn at some point, right? That could happen. It, it could be 140 bucks again. The reality of it is we're looking at a POMV so that we can better utilize our savings and our earnings um, with that range in mind. We want to stabilize the draw so that in case there are those dips which are going to occur, they're going to occur in the market, they're going to occur in the price of oil, um, that we can better balance our a sustainable draw and sustainable um, revenue into the state. Senator Michiki? Yes. Um, and I, I appreciate that question, too. Our plan uh, moves us away from, uh, you know, the price of oil and a budget based on the price of oil. But I think what you're getting at is can we be optimistic in these times? And I just wanted to throw out there that um, the Labor and Commerce Committee had panelists like we usually do at the beginning of session. And we asked several essential questions about jobs in the economy. And one huge bright spot was uh, mentioned by Nolan Clauda. And I'll just quote what he said. In 2017, over 1,000 employer businesses were started, which is an increase over prior years. And those businesses that were started added about 4,600 jobs to the economy. Um, new businesses, on average, create about 5,200 5, jobs a year. And Alaska ranks among the top three states in the country for the, um, our share of the population that start up businesses. And so, we're really looking at the role of innovation in an economy. And I have a, a piece of legislation that creates 2019 as the year of innovation. But that uh, boost to the economy and the jobs that it creates can't really be understated. And it really is a bright spot in the midst of this cautious environment that we're in right now. Other questions? Andrew? Well, I can, um, and largely it's on a complete absence of utilization management. I mean, I, I so so if I separate out, and I don't know if you remember this sheet, and I can get it to everyone, but this is from Senate Finance the other day by the department. Um, but it lists out the uh, the actual usage, the utilization. So when you think about insurance costs, insurance is based on a risk of utilization. These are the actual costs we paid out, right? Um, so this is Medicaid department annual totals of $2 billion. And if you separate out disabled children and adults and the elderly, because I don't believe there's a utilization problem there, and you just isolate it to the, you know, 36% adults and the 24% of healthy children, you're looking at $1.2 billion where we're not exercising utilization management. So there's substantial room for savings. I mean, we're still advertising. In I took my kids to a to a show, and there was a Department of Health and Social Services ad at the beginning of the show in the movie theater, advertising if you need to enroll for um, for Medicaid, where to contact the department. So if no one's managing that utilization, and the users of Medicaid have no idea what their individual cost is. I can tell you that there's substantial room for managing. And I, so they, they have an RFP out for help with that this year, which we hope to see a year and a half earlier. But I can tell you that there is substantial room. No one denies that. It's just been that the department's been slow to initiate that process. And that process is where you would essentially identify the top 30% and those users by cost and move into more of a case management kind of style of making them aware of lower cost services. Um, again, if no one knows the price tag, if you went shopping, you never saw the price tag, and you just got to leave with a cart full of goods, you wouldn't be concerned with those services costs. So we think there's a lot of room for savings. Yes. Mr. Chairman, um, following up on 
savings in health care. Alaska has the highest health care costs in the United States. The United States has the highest health care costs in the world. Family budgets are being killed by the cost of health care and health care insurance in this state. Small business budgets are being crippled trying to provide health insurance for their employees. There are multiple things we can do in government to change that. In fact, we have rules in government that have caused those prices to go up. I have several bills uh, in labor and commerce that will address the cost of health care, the largest one being the repeal or annulment of the 80th percentile rule. That's a complicated rule. I won't explain it here. Uh, but that can change, change the whole game. We have incredibly high insurance costs because of that 80th percentile. Now, Senator Machiki talked about utilization being the driver of health care costs. And, you know, in, in Medicaid, I haven't really looked at it. Perhaps it is a driver. But honestly, it's, it's not the driver in the general public. The general public, the private sector, is not overutilizing health care costs or health care. It's the costs itself that are driving up that, that bill. So, um, Senator Machiki, there, there's a lot of room. You know, people, citizens contact me and they say, you know, we need to have, we need to get government under control. We need to make more cuts. Well, actually, we don't need to make more cuts. We need to look at the rules we have in place and make sure that they're not actually harming the whole process, harming the healthcare industry. Can we, uh, we'll, we'll come back to you, Rich. I want to say it's Senate Bill 129, but I don't quite remember the number of it. But yes, um, there's, a, there's a bill on the 80th percentile. There's a second one which would annul a supervision restriction for mental health care services. Removing this uh, particular supervision rule would allow qualified clinicians of all types to offer mental health services in our state. Right now, mental health clinics have two-year waiting lists because there is such restriction. So that is a second bill which might be about Senate Bill 130. I'm not 100% sure on the number of them. Um, thank you, and I was just trying to get the, the list of bills. I have um, worked with my staff on the schedule for the next two weeks, and I usually release that on the Thursday before. Um, we have several, um, you know, very significant bills in labor and commerce, um, many of them introduced by Senator Giesel. Appreciate her interest in reducing health care costs, and also Senator Wilson has a bill. We'll, we'll be hearing this coming um, very shortly on certificate of need. We've got, uh, you know, many bills um, in the committee, so we'll be taking a look at all of those. I did also want to mention another bright spot, and also tied to innovation, is that the state was the first state in the country to receive an innovation waiver, um, uh, mainly um, done by the work of Lori Winghire in the Division of Insurance for the high-risk Achia pool, and the legislature pass some uh, legislation, uh, I think it was a few years ago, where we reinvested in that program and have seen incredible savings where we reduced the, what we expected to be very significant rise in health care insurance premiums and lowering those. Um, other states in the country now are reaching out to our state.